All right. So, hi, viewers. Um, welcome once again to another episode of my scholarly journey. Um, today, I have the pleasure of speaking to Kojo Safu Jemfi, and I'm also equally curious. I want to know much about him, so I'll allow him to tell me a bit about himself. Um, so, Kojo, uh, do you mind telling me a bit about yourself, where you had your basic education, all the way to um, the university? Okay, so um, I started my basic education at um, Frobel uh, Daycare Center. That was uh, it's, it's now Frobel Educational Complex, I believe. Uh, and then I moved to Kings. Uh, so I spent uh, a long time at Kings International School, also in Kumasi. Um, those times, Kings was um, located all across Kumasi. So I moved um, from one side to the other. So I moved from fifth side, third side, new side. Uh, and I got to Genesis 1 at New Sight. Um, getting into Genesis 2, I moved to boarding house for the first time. So I went to um, Supreme Savior Senior High School. Um, junior high school. Uh, so um, at Supreme Savior was located across the Azantua Girls Senior High School. So um, after that, I just decided to go to Brentford College. Um, uh, uh, so, so I spent some time at Prefer College. I, actually, I wanted to go to Presec, but my dad wanted me to stay in Kumasi, so um, I, I stayed. I went to Prefer College. Um, so from Prefer College, I went to um, uh, KNUSD. Um, again, I had uh, a choice between KNUSD and Cape Coast. I wanted to do Doctor of Optometry at Cape Coast, but uh, again, my dad wanted me to stay in Kumasi. Uh, I think both decisions helped me quite a lot, and uh, yeah, it was very beneficial to me. So um, at KNUSD, after my uh, four years uh, there, I served as a teaching assistant, a research assistant, uh, and then I um, went to Seoul, South Korea, um, where I started my master's, uh, but did not complete it, and then moved to the UK, where I completed my um, PhD. All right. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, so um, with KNUST, did you still try to pursue your goal of wanting to be um, an optometrist or you, you applied directly to the program you pursued? Well, so I applied to uh, electrical engineering at KNUST and then I applied to uh, Cape Coast for Doctor of Optometry. So I had both. Oh, okay. And um, actually during my first semester, I was really to leave the, the program at electrical engineering, uh, KNUSD. Uh, and so because of that, um, you know, I, I wasn't putting in the effort that I probably ought to, ought to have put. Um, until after the fairness when I realized I wasn't going anywhere, uh, then I decided to, you know, to uh, put all my all in, in uh, electrical engineering. Okay, so um, you said after your bachelor's, you worked as a teaching assistant, right? Yeah. So did that experience in any way help you in achieving or securing the position you had in South Korea? Yeah, that, it did a lot. So um, as a teaching assistant, um, unlike most of my colleagues, I spend most of my time doing research um, rather than teaching. Um, so I was helping my lecturer uh, doing, doing some research. So I was running simulations, um, preparing reports and discussing them with him. Um, so these were all very useful things. So when I got to South Korea, I knew I turned out to um, about research. It was very beneficial. All right. So how did you hear about the South Korea um, how, um, opportunity? And how, what was the application process like? And was it also on scholarship? Yes. Uh, so first of all, yeah, I was on scholarship. Um, so what happened was um, when I finished KNST, I had a tentative offer from uh, oil fields, they, they're the largest oil fields. Okay. Um, so I wanted to do a very quick master's and then join them. Uh, so I was focusing on uh, the UK schools. So I spent all my time applying for um, schools then. Uh, I was getting disappointed every now and then. I get uh, admission to Imperial College and you don't have enough funding. Um, so later on, I realized that it wasn't going to help me, so I had to look elsewhere, maybe just um, find a two-year master's and perhaps forfeit my uh, attentive offer. Um, so then I started looking at, by that time it was too late to write a GRE, so I started looking at um, uh, schools in Canada that didn't require the GRE. Uh, and then um, when 
I didn't get into any of those. Um, it happened that uh, some of our senior colleagues uh, back at KNUS, they had contacted uh, these professors in South Korea. Uh, and so they were looking for new students now. Uh, and so that sort of became my last resort. And then I took it and it was so useful, uh, very, very helpful uh, going there. <clears throat> okay, so um, which institute in South Korea was it? That's Seoul Tech, um, Seoul National University of Science and Technology. All right, so it was a regular application process, I guess. Yes, um, regular ap uh, application through the uh, school itself. Okay. Um, so you, you would write maybe some statements of papers and then uh, you just need, uh, I think, just one recommendation from the professor. Uh, that was about it, yes. And also when you get the admissions, was it automatic that it comes with funding? Um, so the funding is not tied to the admission. Uh, so the funding decisions come from the professors you're gonna work with. Okay. Um, and so um, when they decide that uh, they've got enough funding. So what happened with me actually was that uh, the first professor I was going to work with uh, lost some of his funding, and so he passed me on to uh, another professor uh, who had sufficient funding, even though I had uh, the admission uh, all along. Oh, okay. All right. And you said you didn't finish with the master's. Um, do you mind sharing with us um, your reason for not? Right. Yeah, so uh, in, in 2015, I uh, lost my dad, and, and, and so I uh, lost all motivation to really continue my, my master's. Um, when people talked to me and then I decided to continue, I didn't feel like staying in South Korea anymore. It, it just brought too many bad memories. So I just decided I was gonna apply elsewhere. Okay. Uh, by that time I had spent only about a year in my uh, master's. Uh, so I started applying for a PhD early because normally you have to apply about a year ahead. Uh, so, um, so when I did apply uh, to, to this school, then they, they took my application and they said, yeah, they wanted to work with me, but they wanted me to start in January instead of September. Um, so my master's was gonna end in August of 2016, and uh, they wanted me to start in January of 2016. Um, so I had to make a decision, and uh, one of my supervisors to be, he, he told me that if, uh, the objective of getting a master's was it's only a means to achieve that PhD, then um, it's not a big deal if I dropped out of the master's and started a PhD. Oh, okay. All right. So um, which school did you um, pursue your PhD in? Coventry. All right. Yeah. And then um, was it um, something like they didn't require a master's for the program or there was a special case for you? Well, they... So in, in the UK, you can get into a PhD with a first class. Um, so uh, if, if you do have a first class, you can move from a bachelor's to a uh, PhD directly. So, so it meant that I, I had a first class from KNUST, so it meant I could easily uh, qualify. Um, so that was just to satisfy the admission purposes. Uh, but my supervisors were also looking for uh, things like research experience, which they believe I had, even though I didn't have the master's degree um, yet. So those two uh, helped me in getting into um, coming. All right. So I presume your research experience was mainly from what you had from KNUST or? Well, from my master's. So even though I spent one year, I was able to uh, produce one general paper before I left. Um, and yes, uh, the KNUST, uh, a research assistantship uh, that I did during my national service uh, was also uh, helpful. But primarily it was uh, my research in uh, during my master's uh, because it was uh, sort of relevant to the PhD that I was gonna pursue. Oh, okay. All right, and now to your PhD, the application materials, did you have to just apply to the school and get your funding or you had to write to a supervisor for the supervisor to accept you before you could apply? Yes, yeah, so uh, they have this website, I think, find a PhD or so. Yeah, so I um, contacted a lot of professors uh, over there. So um, I did reach out to my supervisor first, uh, and then uh, I had uh, some 
initial assessment, so phone screen, and then uh, I did some tests. Um, so once those uh, were okay, uh, then I was allowed to um, actually submit the um, formal application to the to the school. Well, wow. yeah. was the test like um, something related to engineering? Yes, uh, okay. and a lot of programming. Wow, interesting. Yeah, in yeah, in the language of your choice. Okay, so they will give you something like say a task, and you need to do it in any programming language that you want to. Yeah, so you initially have to tell them ahead of time that you want to do it in C, for example. I did it in C. Uh, and then they will get the coding environment uh, set up for you. So it was a live coding. Uh, so, yeah, they give you the uh, problem and then you're doing it right there for them to see. Wow. So was it basic coding or it was something that you need to really have like good experience? Oh, I think it was basic. Um, yeah, because prior to that, I was very apprehensive very because I'd forgotten all my C uh, and I did some quick revision, but it was surprisingly like very basic. Oh, okay. All right. So um, when you got your PhD, you already had funding from the supervisor you had interviewed with, right? Right, so um, the funding is really administered by the university. Uh, so um, so you, you speak to the supervisor only so that they can accept you f for that particular funding. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I had already um, uh, had that acceptance uh, given, given to me. Uh, so even without the university sending official admission letter, I had assurance from the professor that I was coming to come Oh, okay. Wow, that's nice. So, I with your PhD in a language that everyone would understand. What did you do for your um, thesis? Um, sorry, I had. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, if 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 yeah. So let's say if someone came to me and then they said that um, maybe they have a temperature of say uh, thirty-eight degrees Celsius. Uh, and so I should decide whether they've got COVID-19 or not. Uh, I'm going to think about it in a slightly different way and say that, well, assuming that you've got COVID-19, what's the probability that I'll record this particular temperature? Uh, this is Bayesian reasoning. Um, so my PhD was uh, in terms of, and, and when you make this sort of uh, assumption, uh, uh, reasoning, you usually, sometimes you're gonna make an error uh, called the base error. Uh, my PhD was um, really into um, how to minimize uh, this this base yeah. error. So it was quite theoretical uh, machine learning stuff. All right. So after your PhD, what did you do next? So after my PhD, um, I uh, did a postdoc. Uh, so it was interesting because um, there, there was a timeline given me that if I was able to finish my PhD by so and so date, uh, I would be given a postdoctoral research fellow offer. Uh, so yeah, I put in every <laughs> effort to to do that. Uh, so I I did a postdoc at Coventry again for um, one and a half years or so, um, and uh, that was a slightly uh, different project, uh, but applying machine learning principles really uh, uh, for tr trying to optimize car cabin comfort. Uh, and then after that, I decided to move to Canada and I transitioned from academia into industry. Okay. All right. So let's talk about it. Is it that you didn't enjoy being in academia or you just wanted to have another experience? Well, in academia, the, the part I really enjoyed in, in academia was teaching. Uh, I, I love to teach, um, but, but I realized that... Um, a lot of emphasis was on, on, on research. And even if you got a, an academic position, when I was a research fellow, for example, I only taught um, a graduate class only once uh, in, in almost two years. So uh, I didn't fancy that very much. Uh, I, I wanted a chance to teach. I, I wasn't getting it. And those positions that uh, require teaching was often looked down upon. Uh, there, there's, yeah, more. For so I just thought that, well, then uh, I, I would just go into uh, industry, work as a data science, and then teach um, part-time. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. All right. So now, 
where are you working um, specifically? Uh, so I'm working at uh, Loblaw Companies Limited. It's uh, internal. Uh, it's um, the largest retail company in, uh, in Canada. Okay. Uh, so I'm working as a data scientist for them. And again, uh, it's, it's sort of these machine learning principles back from my PhD uh, that are being applied here. Uh, so it's more of a research focus in my work as well. So it's not so different from uh, 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 an academia uh, environment. Uh, so. Okay. And I want to know something. So when you were applying for the job in Canada, were you in UK and you just applied and the company, I don't know, probably gave you a working visa or you had family there? How was it? Well, so I first had to apply for permanent residence. Uh, in, in Canada. So it was after I got that, then I uh, got uh, applied for jobs, yeah. And, and did, you, did you get a residency because of your skill sets and your um, qualifications or anyone can try it and just hope uh, they get the um, permit? It's a point-based system. So yes, your qualifications, they give you more points. Your education gives you points. If you have a bachelor's, you have this much points and, and so on. Uh, your English language proficiency, so you've got to write the IELTS, uh, and, and then uh, based on the score, you get points for that. Your age, your work experience, these all give you points. So once you have the sufficient uh, or required number of points, uh, then you're drafted to um, uh, submit an application for Wow, well, this is news to me. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, so after you had the permit, you moved to Canada and that was when you applied for the job? Yes. Oh, all right. That's nice. All right, so um, this will be my last um, question. Um, so looking at your colleagues, your junior colleagues back in Ghana, I don't know if all other people doing engineering can equally use the same path you took, but then what advice will you have for them? That is those who are thinking about a career in academia or even industry, just like you, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, so um, yeah, I would say that, yeah, definitely they can follow the same path. Um, these days, um, the most important thing is um, uh, your coding skills. Uh, so I'm just gonna advise them to uh, take coding seriously. Um, whether it's Python or C, um, these skills are transferable between languages. So just um, find one particular language and then practice it. Um, the other thing is that the, the math is, is very important. Um, if you're getting into uh, this, this part of um, uh, engineering or computer science. Um, so a lot of the time I hear people saying that you know, the math they're doing, they're not applying it in real life and so on and so forth. Um, you are going to apply it if you decide to take this path, um, you know, do machine learning or data science. Uh, those, those things are fundamental uh, to it. And, and, and then lastly, I think for the PhD purposes, uh, I think it's a good idea to try to publish your first um, your undergraduate thesis. If you could do that, um, uh, because um, PhD professors usually look for people who can write because the the end of the PhD or the PhD culminates in a thesis. So if if you have the capacity, the, the ability to write very well, uh, then they look favorably on your application. So if you can write it properly, and then um, you know before you submit your application, just try to write it in in, in terms of maybe a general paper or a conference paper. That's going to be a huge plus uh, to, to to your application. Uh, because I believe that that was what uh, helped me a lot in, in my transition from my master's to my PhD because of uh, one paper I had. It was very important. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Kojo. Um, it was nice talking to you. And personally, my curiosity has been satisfied. And I'm pretty sure those who'd be watching you would also be very grateful for the time you committed to um, share your story with me. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks very much for having me, giving the, this opportunity to share my story. Right. Thanks very thank, much. Thank you very much, too.